Anyway, welcome. My name is Bob Willie, and uh, for the last uh, five years now, I've had the privilege of serving as the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. Uh, it's telling Ron that just it's such such a wonderful group that's here, uh, and through this past year and a half, have done an incredible job of thinking creatively and um, alternatively in providing, continuing to provide services for the community throughout. We've done the same with the Friends of the Library. Uh, this is our fifth year of our Tuesdays with series. Uh, last year we went to video and uh, live streaming as well as putting them on YouTube for people to be able to watch. So we didn't skip a beat. We were able to continue on throughout and uh, that was true throughout all of our schedule and our activities. I'll talk a little bit more about that after uh, Jim's presentation this morning. But anyway, so it's just really an honor to have you here with us today. Tuesdays With is uh, based on, and many of you have heard this before, uh, a, a book written in 1997, Tuesdays with Maury. And uh, that book, I think, is an inspiration to us all of a college professor and a student who continued to have a relationship for many, many years, with the principle being that we never stop learning. And that's what this series is all about, as we provide the very best of speakers on topics that we think are of great interest primarily related to the low country and even more specifically to Georgetown, to be able to appreciate and understand all the wonderful things that are a part of our culture here in the low country. Um, today, we're privileged to have with us Jim Lucan, uh, and he's speaking on the topic of natural resource protection on the South Carolina coast. And so we don't forget, there is a book available afterwards. He'll talk a little bit about that and a wonderful Christmas gift. That's what we need to we start thinking that now as we approach the holidays. Jim started his studies at uh, Southern Illinois University where he did his bachelor's degree. His master's degree was at Western Washington University and his doctorate as he moved closer to the southeast uh, was at Duke University. Came to Coastal Carolina University in 2001 where today he serves as professor of biology and also Associate Dean of the Gupta College of Science. He's a botanist, ecologist, and has worked with both undergraduate and graduate students in efforts to understand and preserve endemic plants, including the Venus flytrap. We should do just a presentation just on that sometime. <laughs> and, because I'd love to hear that, and plant communities of the southeastern United States. He's an established, has an established reputation in restoration community ecology and population biology of plants in coastal regions. And he is the co-author of, this is a book that could be used in a lot of different ways, 101 Wild Things About the Grand Strand. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that too. Anyway, join me in welcoming Jim Lucan to, uh, with us today. Um, thank you for that introduction, Bob, um, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to give this talk. Um, I really enjoy giving these talks. Um, I, I've always um, learned something from these talks that I can never predict, and uh, primarily the questions from the audience. Um, a couple, uh, about a month ago, I, I, I did an interview with our eminent historian in South Carolina, Walter Edgar, and uh, Walter and I just hit it off, and we got done and it was like, he said, you know, I learned some things from this talk. And I said, no, no, I learned some things from this talk. And we just, it was just like a, a great synergy. He'd throw out something and I'd say, I didn't know that. And then I'd throw something out and he'd say, I didn't know that. So I, I really like these talks and uh, hopefully everybody can learn something and I can learn something also. Um, natural resources of the coast. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today primarily is uh, wildlife, fish, and land. And uh, there are a few other natural resources of interest, uh, but those are the ones that I think are, are really important at the coast. And uh, uh, that's essentially why I did this book. Um, you do a book, and oftentimes people say, well, what was the motivation? Why did you write that book? And I had actually two things, um, one of which was that fact right there, which I read in some report and I can't remember exactly where it was, I think it was something published by South Carolina DNR, 30% of the South Carolina coast is under some type of conservation protection right at this moment. Now, in case you're wondering whether that number is big, little, uh, about average, um, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's a huge number. And so, right off the bat, we have a unique 
fact about the South Carolina coast in that somehow or another, and that's what hopefully I'm going to tell you about today, we ended up with 30% of the South Carolina coast under some sort of conservation protection. And when I say some sort of protection, I mean a national forest, a national wildlife refuge, a state wildlife management area, a state park, a conservation easement, any of those types of protections, 30% of the coast um, is under some type, type of protection. Um, compare that to some of the northern states, it's a huge number. The second thing, and the second thing has to do with uh, where we are right now. Um, I, uh, I was uh, looking at some books that had been published previously, and they had these great photos of, uh, of fishermen and hunters in days of yore, and they had these great pictures of, of things they caught and, and, and what they were doing. And of course, if you're a fisherman, and you fish, which I am, and you fish for red drum, and you see this, you go, oh, wow, that doesn't happen anymore. Or, or you go, oh, wow, that can't happen anymore because you'd be arrested if you, if you did that right there. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I find very fascinating because I'm basically an ecologist. And what I like to think about is, okay, how have things changed through time? Um, what were the impacts of these sorts of things historically? Uh, what sort of laws and regulations change so that this is no longer uh, realistic? Um, but nevertheless, we had this, you all had this really great collection of digital photos. And let me just say, you know, Julie, I'm just going to say to you, I, I looked at all the libraries in, around the state, and the, the digital photo collection you have here is the best. I mean, anywhere in the entire state. And, and I don't know how that, that, maybe that needs a book to tell how that came about. But uh, you had this great resource, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this book, and, uh, and, and, and set about to do it. And, and so what I'm going to do today um, it's a small book, but it covers a, a large um, time frame. I'm going to go all the way back about 4,000 years, and then we're going to come all the way up to the present, and we're going to try to understand um, people that lived on the coast, um, how they used the natural resources that were on the coast, and how the landscape for regulating that natural resource use has changed through time. Um, this is, a, uh, this is kind of a, a diagram or, a, or a, a, an animated thing of what the South Carolina coast might have looked like about 4,000 years ago uh, when some Native Americans did periodically live at the coast. And they were really, um, the, the Native Americans that lived here at the coast were one of the, the first people that we can look at and say, okay, here was an intense use of a natural resource. And of course, what we're seeing here are the shell mound builders. And in case you've, you've never um, stopped at the seaweed shell mound that's, uh, that's down near McClellanville, I would urge everyone to do this. Um, the, uh, the story here is about 4,000 years ago, and keep in mind that's well before um, contact with Europeans. There were Native Americans that came to the coast of South Carolina. They occupied areas adjacent to salt marshes. Um, they used oysters primarily, but also clams. They used a lot of them, and when they were done, they would discard the shells in these rings or these mounds. And, uh, and it's really not quite clear at all what was going on here. This particular diagram presumes that they had structures that they lived in near these shell mounds. Um, some people think they didn't live in these places. Some people think these mounds were some sort of ceremonial structures. Other people think maybe they were just refuse dumps and they, they liked circles. Uh, other people think they might have been elaborate fish traps. There's a lot of conjecture about why these Native Americans came to the coast and piled these oyster shells up in these interesting uh, circles or mounds or half circles. Um, still a lot of conjecture and nobody knows for sure. But what we do know for sure is this is probably the first example of intensive natural resource use by people at the coast of South Carolina. If you go to the seaweed shell mound today, which is right down the road, and again, I'd urge you to do that, this is what it looks like. Um, the shells are still there, but of course, 
Um, the, the mounds have been colonized by red cedars and shrubs and, and things like that. You can walk around out there and, and see these shell mounds. If you look down at the ground and you look carefully, occasionally, you, of course, you'll see all these oyster shells, but occasionally you'll see something like that that doesn't quite look like an oyster shell. That, of course, is a piece of Native American pottery. And it's, uh, it's really quite interesting that uh, there are these fragments of pottery literally laying on the ground in these shell mounds. Some of it, uh, some people think, is, is recent. And when I say recent, I mean from Native Americans that were there at the time of European contact. But other people think it's, uh, it's prior to that. So clearly interesting uh, place. And there's a little bit closer uh, picture of some of the pottery pieces that, uh, that you can see laying on the ground there. Um, that, of course, was a long time ago, and now we're going to fast forward to something a little more recent in time. And uh, this particular uh, uh, picture was done um, presumably from a, from a realistic situation in North Carolina in 1585. And, of course, we're going to ask that question over and over and over again. What types of natural resources were people using and what were their impacts? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, determining the impacts of Native Americans on natural resources is really difficult because there are no records. Uh, basically, we have pictures like this. Um, what we can glean from pictures like this is Native Americans that lived at the coast, of course, used dugout canoes. They apparently used fish traps. They used spears. Um, they had rudimentary nets. Um, but the problem, of course, at the coast of North Carolina and South Carolina is all of this stuff is label. And what I mean by that is it disintegrates and it went away. So we have no long-term record of just exactly what was going on with the Native Americans. But we are pretty sure they made heavy use of some of the fish that lived at the coast. And uh, we have some better records a little bit later on of just exactly um, what sort of resources they were using and, and in, what, uh, in what magnitudes. I'm basically a biologist, and when I set out to do this, uh, do this book, really I was looking for data. And, uh, and as we'll see here in just a few minutes, as far as Native Americans are concerned, data is really hard to come by, and I'll tell you why that is here in just a few seconds. Um, even the simplest aspect of Native Americans is difficult to get good data on. Um, I, I made this little map of the different tribes of Native Americans that were purported to live at the coast of South Carolina. There was a northern group. There was a southern group. Um, you might notice that a lot of our rivers ended up being named after Native American tribes. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, this map looks accurate, but it probably isn't accurate. And again, I'll tell you why. The records of the number of Native Americans that lived here prior to European contact are very sparse. And uh, even the books and the, uh, the, the papers that have been written by this, the, the people who study Native Americans are an interesting group. They basically are always in conflict with each other saying, oh, this person's data are bad, this person's data, he made this stuff up. It was, it's a really interesting type of literature. But nevertheless, we're pretty sure that when Europeans first came here, they encountered Native Americans. And, uh, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, uh, the only real artifact that persists, of course, telling us something about natural resource use at the coast are arrowheads. And of course, we have no stones at the coast. All we have are sand and shells, right? And so uh, arrowheads like this, of course, had to be brought inland. And uh, there are, of course, arrowheads that can be found at the coast of South Carolina. This is a collection that was uh, it's in the Horry County Museum. And so we know, indeed, that Native Americans um, made use of arrowheads, and we know that they, uh, they hunted, but the question is, of course, what were their impacts on the land? Um, and, and as far as that question is concerned, I can only answer that definitively for one aspect of nat natural resource use, and that's this right here. Anybody know what this is? Anybody got any of these in their closet at home? 
deer skins, or more commonly called buckskins. All right? So let's fast forward to about late 1600, 1700, and now we're talking about Europeans have come, they've made contact with the Native Americans, and uh, initially, when the Europeans made contact with Native Americans, um, they very quickly observed uh, what the Native Americans were doing in terms of hunting and fishing, and then they very quickly started hiring Native Americans as hunters, as guides. Um, in the book, I found some passages where some of the early planters, all of them would hire a Native American as a hunter, and uh, the, the Native American would go out and, and kill deer or whatever, and for a while that worked okay. However, Something happened in about the uh, middle 1700s, but before I go there, let me back up here. Um, it's really kind of disturbing when you look into the Native American situation in, in South Carolina and try to understand how many were there and what they did. And the reason for that is, of course, is very quickly they started to vanish. And uh, one of the reasons why they started to vanish was, of course, the diseases that Europeans brought here. And then, of course, they were also, in many cases, uh, pushed off of their lands. Uh, a lot of the lands that, uh, uh, that were Native American villages were some of the first lands that were claimed by Europeans when they came here. And so it's almost as if they, they started to just dwindle and go away, and then suddenly uh, they were no longer here. But before that happened, and this is a contributing factor right here, Native Americans would make use of deer skins for clothing, the Europeans observed this. Um, they bought some of these deerskin clothing. They took them back to Europe, and guess what happened? Everybody in Europe wanted a buckskin suit. It became a fashion trend. Right? It's kind of like, uh, well, I don't know what a current fashion trend is, because I'm not very trendy. But nevertheless, it created a huge market for deerskins. Um, the huge market for deerskins uh, meant that a lot of the Native Americans got redirected to hunting deer to satisfy this commodity trade. Um, initially, almost all the deerskin trade went out of Charleston, and uh, therein, of course, is the very first situation where we can put some numbers on natural resource use because the shipping records of deer skins out of Charleston. They kept very good shipping records. And so you can go back, people have gone and looked at those records and they've counted, looked at the number of deer skins shipped out of Charleston. Thousands and thousands of deer skins were shipped out. What was the net effect of this? Well, as you can imagine, um, the net effect on this on deer populations, not only in South Carolina, but in other places was not good. Um, as I point out here, 1674 marked the start of the large-scale deerskin trade in South Carolina. And what happened as a result of that is deer, deer populations began to dwindle. Um, more problematic still, however, um, is the way the deerskin trade contributed to the demise of Native Americans. Because prior to this, Native Americans worked as hunters or guides. They, uh, they did agriculture, um, but mostly uh, the men uh, in Native American uh, settlements would go out and hunt, and they would, uh, they, would, they would till the fields. When this deerskin trade started, the men entirely shifted their focus to, to killing deer just to sell the skins, which then they traded to the Europeans for various sorts of things. Um, it was a, uh, there have been books written about the deerskin trade. Apparently it was a, uh, it was not a, uh, it was not a kind commodity exchange. There were traders. There were all kinds of problems trying to regulate the trade. Uh, net effect, of course, of this was eventually deer population started to decline. And by 1900, white-tailed deer were almost extinct. Um, by 1900, Native Americans were almost extinct also. So there was this sort of dual decline of Native Americans and deer that happened in the coast of South Carolina. And, uh, and actually, by the early 1800s, Native Americans were almost completely gone or were pushed out of South Carolina. Uh, many people think this deerskin trade contributed to this uh, just because it disrupted the traditional ways in which they used to make their living and get their food. So 
Let's move on to another period in the coast of South Carolina. Uh, this is uh, this is us right up in here somewhere. Um, this is a uh, an early map of uh, of Georgetown County and Winyaw Bay. Um, when the Europeans arrived, uh, of course, along the rivers, that was the first uh, areas that were settled, and. Uh, the, uh, the, the river edges, which of course later on will become uh, a lot of the rice plantations, were, were prime real estate. Um, as you go up and down the coast of South Carolina, uh, you see the rivers being the major places for early settlement. And uh, over and over again, the, the major uh, uh, cities that uh, emerged, Georgetown, Charleston, um, Buford, all of them were, were some of the uh, initial cities that, uh, that were founded by the Europeans. Early on, when the Europeans came, of course, there was something called the proprietary government. Um, the proprietary government was, a, uh, was uh, basically a, um, a, a situation that was put in place as, by the king, and uh, his, uh, his friends were given the land of, of Carolina, and uh, basically, the, uh, the Charter of Carolina was basically just a description of the natural resources that were there and basically said, we claim these for the Lord proprietors, and uh, they in turn put in place the proprietary government. Now, um, the question I wanted to ask, of course, well, what were some of the early ways in which these early governments tried to regulate the environment or natural resources? And uh, scan through a lot of the, uh, the historical books about uh, acts and resolutions in, uh, in South Carolina. And as best I can tell, uh, one of the very first laws trying to regulate natural resources in the state of South Carolina was in 1726. Um, and it had to do with obstruction of rivers and creeks. And this, of course, just goes back to this idea that rivers and creeks were incredibly important for commerce, for travel. Uh, for just about anything you wanted to do. And uh, the problem was uh, people were putting dams on the rivers and creeks. Um, they were cutting trees that were obstructing the rivers and creeks. And then there was this other problem. Whenever there was a dam, somebody would come along and throw poison in the water to poison the fish. The fish would come up, and that's how they would harvest the fish. And so as best I can tell... Um, 1726 was the very first attempt by a government to regulate a natural resource in the state of South Carolina. Um, there were other attempts. They were all pretty much um, empty regulations because, as I'll show you uh, time and time again, many of these early regulations basically had no one to enforce the laws, and so they were, they were basically just writing laws to put them in place, but pretty much everybody was ignoring them. Um, 1769 is an interesting one, and this is one where Walter, and Edgar, I, Walter Edgar and I had a good discussion about this one. 1769, about the height of the deerskin trade, and what was happening um, in 1769 was uh, many of the, uh, the Europeans borrowed from the Native Americans a hunting approach that was called fire hunting. And fire hunting was uh, basically when people would uh, have either big pots of fire or torches, and a lot of guys would go into the woods at night with fire and torches, and they would drive the deer into one uh, single point, and then when they get them all in one single point, they'd shoot them, and this was sort of a way of, of doing mass harvest, and apparently Native Americans had done this, so the Europeans uh, borrowed this uh, particular uh, uh, hunting approach. The attempt to regulate deer hunting, and in particular the banning of fire hunting, this just sort of shows you the mindset, was actually not done to stop the killing of deer. It was actually done to stop the killing of people. And so you can imagine, if you can, 20 guys with torches in the woods at night with guns. They drive all the deer to one place, and then they start shooting. Well, apparently they shot each other at a, such a high rate at night. And not only did they shoot themselves, but they shot cattle. They shot everything by mistake. And so this law right here, 1769, 
was an attempt to regulate hunters shooting each other. And then Walter Edgar pointed out to me, he says, well, you know, if you were caught fire hunting before the Revolutionary War, you got conscripted into the army because, uh, so they didn't have a way to find you, but they certainly had a way to punish you if you were caught fire hunting because, uh, of course, this is right near the Revolutionary War. So caught fire hunting, you're in the army now. Uh, and then I suspect that was a, a pretty good way of, uh, of uh, trying to regulate the fire hunting. Um, 1700s, early 1800s, the laws regulating natural resources were few and far between. They would, they would uh, every now and then put a law in place, but there was no way to enforce it, and it was pretty clear that not much was happening in terms of enforcement. 1847, before the Civil War, um, tried to protect oyster beds as private property, and, uh, and I'll talk about this in, in just a few minutes. Uh, uh, the, the, the harvest of oysters uh, as, a, as a private property uh, was happening and, and apparently there were a lot of conflicts about who owned, who owned the oyster beds and, and who could, who could har harvest them. And then of course we see some, uh, some political things to pop up in the history of, uh, of regulations. 1855, non-residents banned from hunting and fishing. Of course this is right prior to the Civil War and there are a lot of northerners who were coming to South Carolina to hunt and fish, and of course we, uh, we put a stop to that pretty quickly right before the Civil War. And so uh, the banning of non-residents from hunting and fishing is something we'll see over and over again as various political things popped up in the state of South Carolina. Um, Civil War happened. And it seems like with everything in the history of South Carolina, um, the Civil War is a punctuation mark where, where Many things changed, and, 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 and significant sort of, uh, of events started to occur. Um, after the Civil War, um, there, was a, uh, there was a sort of a heightened use of natural resources, and the heightened use of natural resources was primarily associated with unregulated, unregulated market hunting and fishing. Um, after the Civil War, of course, there is a period of rapid economic development. Um, people at the coast of South Carolina, and in particular right here in Georgetown, recognized that uh, the coast of South Carolina had a, still had abundant natural resources, and those natural resources could be taken, they could be packaged up, and they could be shipped either to Charleston or they could be shipped north, and people could make a lot of money. And so, Unregulated market hunting right after the Civil War was a huge problem as far as natural resources were concerned. And I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, some of the species that were particularly uh, focused on and were not particularly uh, helped as a result of this. Um, this, of course, is an Atlantic sturgeon. If you've been out in the Waccamaw River even today, occasionally you'll see a sturgeon roll. Um, after the Civil War, um, actually right here in Georgetown, there was a huge commercial fishing industry for sturgeon. Um, and they weren't locals, and we'll see this over and over again. They were commercial fishermen that came from the north, um, and they would set up what were called sturgeon camps. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a drawing from about the late 1800s. It's right on the uh, bank of the Waccamaw River. Um, if you look carefully at this, you'll see there's a, they had some boats, they had nets, there's one of the nets up there, and then they had these floating pens where when they caught the sturgeon, they'd put the sturgeon in the pens and hold them and then they would butcher them. Um, the sturgeon commercial fishery, actually right here in the Georgetown and in the Waccamaw River, you could write books about what went on as a result of this. Um, one of the things that happened is uh, the, uh, the first thing they did, they set up these sturgeon camps right around Georgetown. And uh, there was apparently so many dead sturgeon laying around, the mayor of Georgetown passed a law that said, no more butchering of sturgeon near town. You've got to take these camps somewhere else because it's creating this horrible environmental problem. Um, the other problem that occurred was uh, the, the sturgeon fishermen would stretch these nets all the way across the river. 
they would catch sturgeon, but they'd also catch a lot of other things. And there's, there was set up this incredible uh, sort of conflict between fishermen down at the lower ends of the river and, and people who wanted to fish at the upper ends of the river because the, the idea was that all the fish were being caught at the coast and none of them were being allowed to migrate upstream, which was probably correct. Here's what happened to the sturgeon, and it's a repeating theme, almost identical to what happened with the white-tailed deer. Um, the sturgeon fishery after the Civil War, huge numbers of sturgeon were caught, and then of course they started to decline. Notice 1900, about the time again where things start to bottom out, and as far as the sturgeon were concerned, almost drove them to extinction. Um, 1985, a fishery was closed, and they've never, ever recovered. And so the, uh, the sturgeon fishery that was once in place right here in Georgetown um, had a heyday, um, but as a result, a pretty much unregulated take of sturgeon, uh, the, those populations were driven down and they never recovered. We have a guy at uh, the university where I work, his name's Derek Crane, he's, uh, he studies sturgeon in the Waccamaw River. Now, you can still catch them. Um, they don't usually get as big as they used to get, and they're trying to figure out uh, you know, whether they can ever get the populations to recover. But this is, a, uh, this is sort of a common pattern that we see. Uh, we can think about 1900 as ba basically kind of the, the grim year in South Carolina as far as natural resources are, are concerned, because basically we caught them all, <clears throat> or we sold them all, or we ate them all is what it boiled down to. So what started to happen um, at that particular point in time was people started to think, well, we need some regulation. And so um, 1870, uh, there were some fish commissioners named to enforce the laws, but they were uh, largely based in Columbia. Um, they, uh, they attempted to regulate how big these nets could be that got stretched across the mouths of the coastal rivers. They tried to set seasons for catching certain fish. Um, and as I say here, um, they actually tried to deploy some fish wardens in every county. They put two fish wardens in every county. Um, but as, as far as I could tell from everything I read, there was still little or no enforcement um, the Georgetown Times, a lot of the, uh, the editorials that were in there, they talked about these, these laws that were passed, but every now and then one of the wardens would write something in there and he'd say, try to understand the situation here. He says, I'm one person, it's impossible for me to sort of police the entire coast of, of Georgetown County because it's just impossible, the, the, the area is too vast. Um, and so basically, as far as enforcement of these laws were concerned, enforcement was almost non-existent. However, apparently we had really interesting problems right here near Georgetown. In 1891, uh, the, the, the problem of illegal fishing for sturgeon and shad was so acute, uh, the state legislature actually funded the first warden boat and uh, it was uh, deployed on the Waccamaw River just to try to address a lot of the illegal sturgeon and shad fishing that was going on on the, uh, on the Waccamaw River. Actually, it was deployed up near Buck Creek, where Buck Creek comes into the Waccamaw River. And so uh, that sort of gives you the unique position we had here. Huge amounts of sturgeon as well as shad were taken, and uh, apparently there was a lot of illegal fishing that was going on. At the same time, there was also a lot of illegal hunting that was going on. And the, the hunting that was going on primarily for ducks was not for sport, but it was primarily for market hunting. Uh, people would, uh, would you know, kill a lot of ducks. They'd, uh, they'd bring them down, they'd clean them, and they'd ship them to various places. Uh, quite a lucrative trade. Uh, this apparently is a, a wagon showing uh, um, ducks being sort of carted through the streets of Georgetown. Georgetown, again, was the center of market hunting for ducks in the late 1800s. Um, it, was, uh, it was something that was widespread, and uh, it was something that, uh, that occurred uh, 
quite regularly as, as far as the coast of South Carolina was concerned. And at about the same time, there was another problem, and it had to do, again, with the issue of fashion. Um, this time, it wasn't Europeans wanting a certain fashion. This time, it was women in New York. Uh, women in New York decided that they really liked these very fancy plume hats. Um, hats with plumes of uh, wading birds stuck in them. Uh, you walk the streets of New York in the late 1800s, every woman wanted a plume hat, and of course for every plume hat there was a dead bird. And apparently shorebirds, in particular egrets, herons, um, just about anything with feathers was uh, subject to what became known as the plume trade. The plume trade basically was uh, uh, the killing part was done in the southeast and the wearing part was done in the northeast. Uh, it was so prominent you could see cartoons like this in uh, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. Basically you see a guy with a gun here, he's shooting some birds and then here's the guy pulling the feathers off the birds and uh, the, the millinery trade as it was called made use of these feathers to make these hats. And in some cases, it wasn't just plumes. It was entire birds that were stuck into these, uh, stuck into these hats. Um, South Carolina and Florida, as well as Georgia, uh, heavy areas as far as what are called plume hunters, where they would go out into the rookeries and, and shoot the birds that produce these plumes. Uh, Audubon himself had some, uh, some writings about uh, uh, following some of the plume hunters into these rookeries and the, and the really kind of grisly uh, descriptions of what happens when you go into these rookeries and they would shoot um, egrets and herons in the trees and they would fall out and they would, they would get the feathers and so on and so forth. Um, so now we're at late 1800s. We've got rampant market hunting, ducks, fish, I left out terrapins, that's in the book also, but uh, huge amounts of market hunting, people catching all these uh, fish and game, packaging them up, shipping them to population centers. We had the plume trade, uh, people shooting birds just for feathers, and not surprisingly, late 1800s, going up to that critical 1900 part, uh, just about every type of fish, bird, game that you can imagine uh, was in short supply at about 1900. And then along came, and, and about that same particular point in time, um, we saw sort of the beginning of what, it, what we'll simply call the conservation movement. Not surprisingly, because up, up until that point in time, there had been no conservation movement. And actually, there were kind of two groups that were interested in conservation, and they kind of formed at the same time in the late 1800s. The first group were sportsmen, and, and indeed there were, um, there were groups of people who started to do what we call sport hunting, and, and sport hunting of course is different from market hunting. Market hunters would basically shoot as many birds or catch as many things as they can and ship them north and sell them. Sport hunters are a little more enlightened, you know, they're interested in preserving the fish and game, they're interested in the rituals associated with the sport. They're interested in, uh, in wise use of the natural resources. And that's also when we saw the, the beginning of, of magazines like Field and Stream and things like that, which actually started the, the sort of the, uh, the philosophy of what it means to be a sport hunter. And at the same time, another group formed, and that was called the Audubon Society. And, uh, and I talk about this. This is one of the things I, I sort of discovered in South Carolina that I had really no idea about until I did the book. Um, the Audubon Society, which we all know about, had formed in the uh, late 1800s primarily to stop the plume hats. They, uh, they, they, and it was mostly women, you know, and they would go around New York and they would, uh, they would shame the women who were wearing these plume hats and tell them, you know, that this hat you're wearing was responsible for killing all these birds. Um, they were very good politically. They went around getting fish, uh, the, uh, uh, game conservation laws passed. And um, what they started to do was they started publishing a lot of, of pamphlets and, and booklets about what were the threats to birds. Um, I show you this one because 
Every year they would publish a list of the things that were of greatest threat to birds. At the top of the list were market hunters. Second on the list were pot hunters. Uh, pot hunters basically are just people going out trying to shoot meat. Third thing on the list was, I love this, boys with guns. And uh, <clears throat> you look at this boy with a gun, he kind of looks like he could be really rough on just about anything that moved. Um, long story short, Audubon was really successful in convincing the general public and actually convincing legislators in South Carolina to start to do something. Prior to 1900, we had all these laws in place. Nobody was really enforcing them. 1907, the state of South Carolina basically had no real effort to enforce fish and game laws, and, and, and it was a problem. Uh, but in 1907, they decided to do something. And uh, this sort of tells you that they weren't really serious, but they knew they had to do something. And so the, the, the governor and the state legislature said, look, we got all these people talking about all these problems, the market hunters, the plume hunters, you know, the pot hunters, the boys with guns. Um, we got to do something. And they said, look, we don't really want to deal with this issue of enforcing fish and game laws because really we're not interested in doing that. Um, that's sort of the impression I got is they, they put a lot of these laws in the books and then they wouldn't fund anybody to enforce the laws and, and that tells me they didn't really want to enforce the laws. They were just sort of window dressing. 1907 they said, look, let's just turn everything over to the Audubon Society and they did. They basically said, look, we named the Audubon Society to be the enforcers of all fish and game laws in South Carolina and um, we're going to appoint, we'll let the Audubon Society recommend the first chief game warden. First chief game warden we had was in 1910. It was a fellow by the name of James Henry Rice, who I do believe is related to our um, congressman, uh, Tom Rice. I think he might be his great, great grandfather or something like that. Um, James Henry Rice was a avid birder. He went to Columbia and he set out to save all the birds. Um, and I always, I always hesitate when I do this pun, but I have to do it anyhow. Basically, all he did was ruffle feathers. Um, I, I, I just can't stop myself from doing it, okay? He went to Columbia. He started trying to get the, the legislators in South Carolina, the governor, to pass all these laws to protect the birds. He was, he was a horrible failure, okay? He just made a bunch of enemies. Um, he got crosswise with the governor. The governor wouldn't give him any money, wouldn't give him any resources, wouldn't give him anything. He wrote all these scathing articles in the bird books about South Carolina. They're not serious about enforcing laws. They won't give me a penny. All this stuff. And, and make a long story short, um, he didn't last very long. It lasted about three years. And then uh, they appointed this guy, Alfred Aldrich Richardson, as the chief game warden. Um, a lot of things started happening at about that time. Um, let me just say that Alfred Aldrich Richardson was politically astute. James Henry Rice loved birds. Okay, that's about, that's about the best way I can encapsulate the whole thing here. Uh, Richardson set out to structure what would eventually become the current game warden system we have in the state of South Carolina. He basically went in there and he said, look, we need game wardens deployed in the field. And he says, He's, here's what I'm going to do. He says, we're going to deploy these game wardens and it's not going to cost the, cent, the state one penny. And the reason why it's not going to cost one penny is because we're going to be totally funded from fines and licenses. Good idea. Nobody could argue with that. And then he even sweetened the deal. He said, look, half of the fines and licenses, the money that I collect for that, I'm going to give to the local schools in the counties. Who could argue with this? Okay, so basically he said, this is the model we're going to operate on. And uh, every year he'd produce a report. And every year you could see his success. I mean, the, the money just got bigger. The number of wardens deployed in the field got greater. Um, and he lasted a long time um, in the job. And basically, you can trace the origin of the, of the current 
fish and game warden system we have in the state of South Carolina to uh, this guy in 1913. Uh, incidentally, if you know anybody that works for the South Carolina DNR, they still use the same model for funding. Uh, they're funded primarily from licenses and fines. They get, of course, some money from the federal government, but it's still basically the, uh, the model put in place by Richardson for better or for worse. We see some things start to happen about 1910. Um, they did some things um, um, that seemed a little odd, but it, it tells you sort of the state of development. They actually started to identify which fish are game fish and which fish aren't. Um, they actually identified which birds are game birds and which ones aren't. They had this controversy about, you know, what's a game bird? What's not a game bird? Why can't you shoot herons? You know, are they game birds or not? Um, and it wasn't until 1915 that we see the first hunting license, um, which was, of course, two years after this guy. He basically said, we need a hunting license. I'll use the money to fund the game wardens, and that's basically how it worked. And there were still some things that were a little odd. Um, 1919, apparently they were still having problems with dynamite fishing, kind of like fire hunting. You know, I guess that's where you throw dynamite in the streams and you, uh, you blow the fish up to the, uh, up to the surface. And then about 1918, we start to see the federal government get in, involved. And that's when we see things start to really change, um, just because um, as soon as the federal government starts to pass some of these sweeping laws to, to regulate market hunting, to regulate the methods that can be used to hunt, to regulate the seasons for migratory birds, that's when a lot of money starts to flow to the state of South Carolina. And that's when we start to see a lot of things start to happen. One aspect that's really unique in the state of South Carolina is this issue of impounded rice fields. Um, and uh, this is something that sort of came out of the book that I didn't really think about too much, but again, my conversation with Walter Edgar sort of strengthened some of this. And basically, if you look at that 30% number that I was talking about earlier, a big chunk of that protected land at the coast of, coast of South Carolina are, are in these impoundments uh, that were historical rice fields, which of course were carved out of forested swamps in many instances. Most of that work originally done by African American slaves. Um, and if we want to trace the origin of that particular landscape type, it started out of course prior to the Civil War as these rice fields that were used for commodity production. Um, after the Civil War, uh, there was this interesting sort of shift that occurred where the, uh, the impoundments that were used for growing rice were used for duck hunting, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then eventually what we see, of course, beginning in the 1940s is these same impoundments started to work their way into the public domain as either the state or the federal government began to buy these, uh, buy these lands. This, of course, is, a, is an impounded rice field. If you can try to envision what this once looked like, it was a, uh, it was a tidal swamp, but uh, there was this uh, intensive land modifications that went into that with uh, the building of dikes and the water control structures. Most of it, of course, done with, by the work of African-American slaves. And then, of course, after the Civil War, the whole situation changed, but what happened after the Civil War is what a lot of people call the Second Northern Invasion. And we're all familiar with the Second Northern Invasion. The Second Northern Invasion was when the uh, sort of the wealthy industrialists from up north um, decided to come to South Carolina and purchase a lot of these old abandoned rice plantations. And, and basically, they were trying to, of course, recapture some of the good hunting and some of the other leisure activities that occurred on these, uh, on these plantations. Um, it's sometimes amazing when I look at the records just how much of these old plantations were bought up by northern businessmen during the uh, second northern invasion. Uh, the most interesting part of this, I think, um, is that about the 1940s, apparently, the, the northern invaders kind of lost interest in the hunting and the leisure activities, and a lot of these things went back onto the market, and that, of course, is when they, uh, they found their way into the hands of the state or the federal government, and, le and a lot of them ended up in national wildlife refuges, state parks, wildlife management areas, 
or any other type of protected area you can think about. So we sort of see this, this chain of a lot of these coastal lands that began with these rice impoundments sort of shifted to hunting or leisure impoundments and then eventually to protected areas. And that's one of the things I think that's really unique about the history of South Carolina. We're still building impoundments in South Carolina. This is, uh, this is a picture taken down in the Tibwin, uh, Francis Mary National Forest. We're still building dikes to impound these things, water control structures, primarily done now not for hunting, but for conservation of birds. And so some of these practices that began in the 1700s continue even today in, in terms of trying to preserve um, some of the natural resources that we have here at the coast. And I'm going to stop right there because I think I'm about out of time, but uh, in particular, of course, I'm going to thank this librarian, Julie Warren, for helping me out as far as this book is concerned. A lot of the pictures in the book uh, came from here, but uh, there were some other people that had some uh, pictures, but I'm just going to tell you right now, this one up here was the best collection of pictures anywhere in the state as far as I'm concerned. And I'll stop right there and take any questions. Back in the 1700s when the fish were poisoned, what did they use those fish for? <laughs> That's a, okay, so that's a good one. So fish poisoning, I tried and I tried to figure out just exactly how that was occurring, okay? You can find evidence of Native Americans in the upstate, in the forested areas, they use bark of certain trees to poison fish, all right? But it seemed to me they passed that law and it was much more ubiquitous than that. And then I read something about people would use lye, they dam up and pour lye in the water. And, and, and as best I could tell, maybe they just didn't care. Maybe the understanding of, you know, Poisoning fish was not a problem as far as eating the fish. I mean, that might have been the level of understanding they had right now. All they were trying to do was make them float to the top so they could harvest them. Not, not like today where, you know, you wouldn't do that. Maybe it was the fish meal industry. You know, there was, there was a time where fish meal was a um, big industry. Fish that could have been, yep. My understanding of that is that was usually at the coast with smaller fish, but it could have been too, yeah. But the fish poisoning thing is that it's an interesting one. There, I read a book, African Americans uh, the, apparently had done that uh, in Africa before they came over, and apparently that was one of the practices they brought with them. So you had Native Americans doing it, African Americans doing it, and then you had Europeans looking at the two of them going, well, we can do this too, right? So you had that sort of interesting sort of cross-fertilization of, of ideas as far as that's concerned. You described the new impoundment at Tidman. Uh, has uh, DHEC lightened up on not permitting impoundments, or uh, is that uh, because it's federal? Or not? Is it, in general, they don't permit new impoundments. That's, that's definitely on public land, and um, I would say they haven't lightened up at all if it's on private land, right? But in, but in terms of this one, um, you know, there's interpretive signs down there, and basically the goal is to, to improve habitat for wading birds and things like that. So I think as far as creating habitat for wading birds and things like that, they're okay with building impoundments. The, the interesting thing about impoundments, they've been, I can't, there have been so many sort of summary statements on them trying to address a very simple question. Are they good or are they bad, okay? And, and, and as best I can tell, um, they're good for birds, bad for fish, all right? As you, and you could, you could figure that out too if you just sat there and thought about it for a second. And, and I loved it, uh, 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 Dave Tufford at USC, he wrote one of the last big reports and he had reams and reams of scientific data and basically at the end of the report he says, you know, they're, they're bad for fish, they're good for birds, but one thing's clear, they're important in the history of South Carolina. And, and that, I think, summed it up really, really well as far as why people think these, uh, these are so important and why we continue to build them is what it boils down to. They're culturally and historically significant. And this, that's pretty much unique to South Carolina, too, I have to say.
Yep. As the population of the state grows, particularly along the coast, is con conservation in general on the increase or decrease? What kind of conflict? Because if people come, you develop, you take away land, you take away the wetlands, and so on. At least that's what I see going on. Yep. Um, the last chapter of the book, I talk about two big studies that were done, one up in Horry County and one down in Charleston. And without a doubt, you know, we're losing wetlands at the coast. I mean, that's, that, that's about as, as, as clear as it can be with just some simple measurements. And not only are we losing wetlands, we're losing forest. Um, where I live, you know, the number of people utilizing the resource now, I fish a lot, and I don't even fish on the weekend anymore because it's just so crowded. I mean, and so at some point in time, and, and, and we sort of see, you know, them trying to sort of continually restrict what you can take, how, how big they have to be, and how many you can take. And, and you, you will just see that on and on and on. There's no way, you know, it's ever going to go back the other way with as many people there are who are coming to the coast. And, 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 and what it will eventually be, I don't know, but uh, right now, you know, in some, in some places, Charleston, Horry County, you know, and up near Beaufort, the, the number of people coming is just incredible, and, and that, that, of course, eventually is going to cause big problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yep. And, and, uh, and I will uh, sell you some books and autograph them back there if you, uh, if you want one. Rem remember that Christmas is coming, you know. So. <laughs> I strongly encourage you to do that. I, uh, I have been saying, and I, I mentioned this to uh, Jim before, what a, what a great resource we have in our county. Uh, just fantastic opportunities. Actually, this past Saturday, my wife and I went out to the Aukey Wildlife and Jim Lee gave us a tour out there. And if you have not done that, I would highly recommend uh, that South Island, Cat Island area to be able to see that. You talk about the conflicts and the struggles, but the resources that are here are just fantastic, starting at, I'm thinking Huntington Beach State Park, and you go across the Brook Green, what's happening there. You come on down, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. Obviously, Hop Call. Uh, then you come down to Yawkey. Uh, Francis Marion is a wonderful resource. And you mentioned the Shell Middens. I wish they would repair that boardwalk back there, but otherwise you have to walk through the woods. But it is really fantastic to see the several shell middens that are back in there. And I also would recommend another place often overlooked is a place called Ion Swamp. If you've not seen that, it's on the right-hand side of the road as you head south. Fantastic uh, hiking trail back through there, very safe, easy to be done, uh, and uh, would recommend that. It's way by which to, in a sense, celebrate uh, this history that we have along here in both Georgetown County and then as you move south as well. But just fantastic resources and opportunities and thankful to those people who in the mid-1900s uh, were talking about the preservation of lands and being able to have what are these national forests. Oh, at Bull Island, going out to Bull Island. If you've never done that with a butcher, I'm giving you a lot of opportunities here uh, to take advantage of just neat places to go. I've told people when Carol and I moved here seven years ago, we love Georgetown County and we love it more now with all the resources that we have found and opportunities to be able to celebrate exactly what Jim's been talking about in uh, these resources. So again, Jim, thank you. And take advantage of the book and uh, see the pictures in there, especially that Julie's provided to be able to uh, look at some of the history and background of the resources here in the county. I um, want to announce uh, our next Tuesdays with, we actually have a schedule back there if you'd like to pick up a copy of it, third Tuesdays of every month, except December. Uh, we looked at the calendar this year and the third uh, Tuesday is December 21st, we thought that's just a little bit too close uh, to Christmas, so we're not going to be having a December program, but I invite you back on January 18th, Dr. Jeanette Myers, the astronomer at Francis Marion University is going to be with us. Excellent speaker, fun topic on enjoying the winter skies. You know, here we are at 10 o'clock in the morning, but we'll look and we'll think about the winter skies. And I know she'll give an excellent presentation, even as Jim has today. And also coming up on December 11th is our annual Yuletide Home Tour. I mentioned at the outset that we've been doing some creative alternatives uh, with the friends in the library. Last year, we did a video tour that we put up on YouTube. And already we've had, as of this point, over 2,000 people have viewed that as we went around to homes on video, made it available for free to celebrate for the community and to say thank you to everyone. 
But this year, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, we're going to be having a tour on uh, Saturday, December 11th, from 1 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we have 10 homes in the historic district and uh, over across the way in Willowbank uh, that will be open that have been decorated for the holidays, as well as two houses of worship, uh, St. Mary's Catholic, as well as um, Prince George Wignall Anglican Church. And uh, so they'll all be included in tour. Tickets are $20 for Friends of the Library of any of the Friends groups within Georgetown County and $25 for others. And if you want to pick up tickets or get your tickets reserved, go to the desk here and they'll be glad to take your money for those. We're already up almost to about 80, 85 tickets, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to have about twice, three times that for that day. A wonderful opportunity on Saturday, December 11th. I thank you all very much for being here. Look forward to seeing you in January, if not before, and wish you all a wonderful holiday season. And finally, one more time, Jim, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.